making calculators that uh, fit on a desktop and uh, Bill had been thinking about miniaturization and the fact that it is possible to make things smaller and basically went over and challenged the people in the laboratories to make one that he could drop into his shirt pocket. Well, it's been very heavily based on ingenuity. We call it uh, Yankee uh, know-how or whatever and you'll find that uh, it includes every every kind of, uh, of a uh, machine from uh, farming, farming equipment and knitting equipment and all those things. And uh, that's really what I made America great. Before Apple's garage, before Google's dorm room, before the Silicon Valley mythology even had a name, two Stanford engineers quietly sketched out an experiment that would define modern tech culture. In a one-car garage in Palo Alto in 1939, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard built a small company from a $538 bet, a simple audio oscillator, and an ethic of trust and engineering excellence. That little experiment became Hewlett Packard, a company that helped invent Silicon Valley, launched generations of technology businesses, and shaped how modern tech companies think about management, engineering, and corporate responsibility. This is the true origin story of HP. Not the myths, not the shorthand, but the people, choices and culture that made a garage into a global institution. William Reddington Hewlett was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan. His father, a respected physician, died when Bill was just 12 years old, leaving his family in a difficult emotional and financial position. Despite that loss, Hewlett excelled in school, showing a knack for science and a particular love for tinkering with radios and electronics. He had dyslexia, which made traditional academics harder, but he compensated with hands-on curiosity and technical intuition. Hewlett enrolled at Stanford University in the 1930s, where his fascination with electrical engineering found direction under Professor Frederick Terman, a man often called the father of Silicon Valley. Bill was thoughtful, soft-spoken and deeply technical, the kind of person who would spend hours refining a circuit until it was perfect. David Packard, born just a year later in 1912 in Pueblo, Colorado, came from a very different background. His father worked for the railroad, and young Dave grew up with a love for sports and the outdoors as much as academics. He was a tall commanding figure, naturally competitive and disciplined. At Stanford where he arrived on a scholarship, Packard majored in electrical engineering, but balanced his time with football, basketball and track. Unlike Hewlett, Packard was more of a leader and organizer than a tinkerer. He was practical, decisive, and had a knack for motivating people around him. After his time at Stanford, he even worked briefly at General Electric on the East Coast before returning to Palo Alto experience that gave him a sense of how big corporations functioned, and how a smaller, more nimble firm might thrive differently. William Bill Hewlett and David Dave Packard met at Stanford in the 1930s, students of engineering under Frederick Terman, the professor who urged his pupils to build industry, not just study it. Bill was quietly brilliant, technically obsessive and methodical. Dave was a natural organizer, competitive, and gifted at translating technical work into working businesses. In 1939 they rented a small redwood garage on Addison Avenue in Palo Alto and started Hewlett Packard with $538 of starting capital and a handshake. They famously flipped a coin to determine whose name would come first in the company's name and Hewlett Packard was born. Their first commercially meaningful product was the HP 200A audio oscillator, a low-cost high-performance instrument that served radio and sound engineers. The product's credibility took a leap when Walt Disney ordered several units to use while developing the sound effects for Fantasia. That early sale did more than finance the company. It signaled that these two young engineers had built something useful and reliable. From the beginning Bill and Dave were deliberating about how the company should operate. They cultivated what became known as the HP Way, a culture that emphasized respect for employees, decentralized decision-making, trust-based leadership, rigorous engineering and reinvestment in research. Profits were reinvested into product innovation rather than serving short-term financial metrics. When World War II broke out, HP was still a tiny company making precision instruments. But the US government urgently needed reliable electronic test equipment for radar, communications and other military technologies. HP's oscillators and other devices were perfect for the job. Small, accurate and affordable competitors were producing. This demand pushed HP out of its little Palo Alto garage and into real manufacturing facilities. By the mid-1940s, the company had dozens of employees, steady government contracts and revenues that allowed them to invest in R&D. 
In fact, some historians argue that Wadi Y created conditions that allowed Silicon Valley to exist, and HP was right at the center of that shift. For Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, this was more than just a lucky break. They deliberately pursued military work, knowing it would give them the cash flow to stabilize the business and expand into other commercial markets after the war. When the war ended, HP didn't shrink back into obscurity. Instead, it used the momentum to diversify into oscilloscopes, frequency counters, and eventually the computers and printers that made the company a household name. So, World War II wasn't just a background detail in HP's rise. It was the turning point that transformed them from two guys tinkering in a garage into the first anchor of what would become Silicon Valley. The company grew steadily and privately, and its culture encouraging creativity, tolerating failure and giving engineers responsibility became as important as its products. That management philosophy didn't stay inside HP's walls. Dozens of alumni carried the HP way into Intel, Apple, National Semiconductor and many other companies that would define Silicon Valley. In the 1960s and 1970s, HP broadened its product lines while staying true to measurement, control and data. It moved into calculators during the 1970s producing scientific and programmable devices that became indispensable to engineers and scientists. HP entered the printer business and later the personal computer market, leveraging its reputation for hardware reliability and quality. The company's first approach allowed it to deliver tools that professionals trusted. Over decades HP moved from specialized lab instruments to products that entered offices and homes. Its rise to Fortune 50 status was not lightning fast. It was the result of decades of incremental innovation, disciplined management, and an ability to move into adjacent markets without losing technical credibility. The 1990s and early 2000s were a period of transformation and turbulence. Under CEO Carly Fiorina, who took the helm in 1999, HP pursued aggressive expansion. In 2002 Fiorina orchestrated the acquisition of Compaq, a controversial and massive merger aimed at scaling HP's PC business to compete with Dell and IBM. The deal divided opinion inside and outside the company. Critics argued it diluted HP's engineering identity and burdened the company with integration problems, while supporters argued it was necessary to survive the brutal PC market. The Compaq acquisition marked a turning point. It expanded HP's scale but also shifted the culture and introduced the political and strategic complexity that would characterize HP's later years. As the tech industry shifted toward mobile cloud and services, HP struggled to find a consistent strategic identity. CEOs changed. Mark Hurd, who stabilized operations in the mid-2000s, left in 2010 amid controversy. Leo Apotheca briefly led the company before being replaced. And in 2011, Meg Whitman took over as CEO. Whitman navigated HP through difficult years and ultimately presided over one of the most consequential decisions in the company's history. The 2015 split that created two independent public companies. Hewlett Packard Enterprise, focused on servers, storage and enterprise services, separated from HP Inc., which retained the PC and printer businesses. The split was meant to free each business to pursue different strategies, but for many observers it also symbolized the end of the unified Hewlett-Packard that had stood as a coherent, engineering-driven whole since the garage days. Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard remained influential figures long after they stepped back from daily operations. Dave Packard served in public roles, including as US Deputy Secretary of Defense under President Nixon, reflecting how his leadership extended beyond corporate life. Both men were committed philanthropists. The Hewlett and Packard families established major foundations that have donated billions to education, science, and environmental causes, extending their legacy into civic life. Bill Hewlett died in 2001. At the time of his death, his net worth was estimated at $9 billion. David Packard passed away in 1996 at age 83. At his death his estate was valued around $4 billion. Their names live on not just in HP letterhead, but in the management lessons, institutions and public causes they supported. More than products or revenues, HP's enduring contribution is cultural. The Palo Alto Garage is officially recognized as the birthplace of Silicon Valley for a reason. The company showed that technical excellence combined with a humane management style could create sustained industrial success. The HP way influenced generations of tech founders and managers. The company's alumni seeded other firms, academics and venture projects that collectively formed the Valley's ecosystem. Even the rituals, open office collaboration, emphasis on engineering merit and respect for long-term R&D have HP's fingerprints. 
If you had invested just $1,000 in Hewlett Packard's IPO back in 1957 at $16 a share, the story today would be staggering. After multiple stock splits over the decades and the 2015 split into HP Inc. and Hewlett Packard Enterprise, that same modest investment would have multiplied into tens of thousands of shares across the two companies. With HP Inc. trading around the share and Hewlett Packard Enterprise near eight, that original $1,000 stake would now be worth well over $20 million. Not even counting the steady stream of dividends paid along the way. It's a reminder of how a patient bet on innovation, made at the very beginning of Silicon Valley, could grow into a generational fortune. Today HP survives not as a single monolith but as two distinct companies that trace their lineage back to the garage. HP Inc., which continues in personal systems and printing, and Hewlett Packard Enterprise, which services cloud, networking, and enterprise IT customers. Both companies face modern challenges, supply chains, digital transformation, cloud-native competition, and both still trade on reputations crafted over decades. While neither company dominates headlines the way hyper-growth startups do, both continue to generate significant revenues and employ thousands worldwide. The legacy of innovation combined with the philanthropic footprint of the founders ensures that Hewlett and Packard's influence endures. Today, HP isn't just riding on legacy, it continues to hold one of the top spots in the global PC market. In early 2025, HP commanded over 20% of all PCs shipped worldwide, making it the second largest vendor behind Lenovo. When HP sends out 13-14 million units a quarter, that's not just hardware, it's power, logistics, supply chains, partnerships and scale. And in the US, HP leads the pack with roughly 1 in 4 PCs shipped. That gives it extraordinary influence over pricing, design, and where the market moves next. The story of Hewlett Packard is a study in contrasts, humble garage origins and global scale, engineering rigor and managerial warmth, steady product evolution and ugly corporate politics. Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard built something that outlived them, not because of a single breakthrough, but because they built systems, systems of culture, engineering, and trust that allowed the company to adapt for decades. That garage on Addison Avenue is more than a photo op. It's a reminder that big things often start with modest tools, clear principles, and the discipline to keep building.